Well, Merry Day Before Christmas Eve. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you. So, I don't know what I'm going to do. There won't be able to w- listen to Christmas music. It's, you know, all I saw on radio, and I don't know. Just don't sing. <laughs> well, you know, well, anyhow, today, a <laughs> uh, Savior is born. So, imagine that. We have a Christmas lesson. Uh, the scriptures are, of course, on this lesson is from Luke chapter 2, and um, so we'll, I was, the, the, the second chapter, I, I like the introduction, it says, the second chapter of Luke presents a picture of the Romans and angels and shepherds and parents and a baby. <laughs> and um, to the Romans, um, here we have Jesus being born, but to the Romans it means absolutely nothing. You know, it's a it's an event that comes and goes, and they you know they could care less. Um, so similar similarly today, we have people that Christmas comes and goes, and they could care less. Uh, it doesn't interrupt their routine. Uh, they just you know there's too much too much traffic at the malls and stuff like that. Well, for the angels, these are the eternal messengers of hope. And um, they announce that uh, Jesus is being born. And we find that um, their supernatural appearance and communication with the shepherds reminds us of God, how that he takes the initiative to let us know what's going on, that they made a divine declaration. So God also speaks to us through the scriptures and through situations and through people and through songs and all that, we still have uh, God communicating with us, just as He did in the uh, with the shepherds to with the angels to the shepherds and to Mary and to Joseph and and of course the star to the wise men. While the shepherds, they're the kind of the perfect response to the gospel because they hear the message and they go and seek. <laughs> they hear the message about the Messiah being born. They go and seek the 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 baby born in the manger, and then they go from there and tell what um, they had seen and what they had heard. So they're kind of like the um, uh, ideal in, in hearing the message and, and going on. Well, the parents are Mary and Joseph. Of course, they provide leadership and protection and guidance for the infant, and uh, they set an example, as it were, for all of us, as uh, whether... And, and taking care of and looking after and nurturing uh, children or nurturing others. And, of course, then we have the baby. And uh, unlike the uh, pictures, Jesus wasn't born with a halo. <laughs> you know, uh, he was uh, human, uh, and uh, he was in this, you know, I guess you could say in the situation how that um, that there would be no one born of lower estate than Jesus in a manger, in a, in, a, in a stable, in a barn, and being laid in a feed trough. So, uh, so whenever we think of God and we think of God becoming man, I think last week we, uh, we spoke about how that um, perhaps the, the shepherds or, or Mary and Joseph would have been disappointed because they would have been planning for the birth in, in Nazareth. And the next thing you know, they have to go to Bethlehem and, you know, everything was wrong, but everything was right. See, and that's the, the challenge that whenever we um, hear things and see things and things go drastically wrong, maybe they're exactly right. Because we don't have the ability to see beyond our perception of the situation. So if we'd have been showing up at um, Bethlehem stable, you know, 2,000 years ago, we wouldn't have been saying, wow, I think this is God. <laughs> you know, how would, why would God be born in a, in a barn? Well, Christ came so that we could be, what is, I have it somewhere written that um, Jesus became man so that God and man 
could once again be friends. <laughs> you know, I like that, you know, because we were created. Adam and Eve were with God in the garden, and they were friends. They communed with each other. God would come down and walk with Adam and Eve, every, you know, in the cool of the day. And uh, so it was their friendship they had together. Well, Jesus, God, became man so that man and God could become friends. So when we think of God's being with us, uh, we are to know that he is our friend. So um, the beginning, humble birth, it's in uh, Luke 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Now, sometimes whenever we're looking at how that um, God uses non-godly things, to bring about his plan, okay? So Mary and Joseph, I'm sure they were planning to have the baby in Nazareth. But Caesar made a de decree that everybody had to go to their hometown to be taxed. Well, Caesar doesn't know what he's doing in fulfilling pro the prophecies of the scriptures because Mary and Joseph, even though they had a declaration from God that they were going to give birth to the Messiah to, to you know, that, that God was coming and, and Mary was carrying God in her womb, um, they weren't in the right place. <laughs> you know, because the Bible says in the prophecies that Bethlehem is where the, the Messiah is going to be born. Mary and Joseph, they didn't go to Bethlehem. They were in Nazareth. And so they weren't the um, scholars in Scripture to know that, hey, we're the, where are you going with that? <laughs> Thought I'd say that. Hey, where are you going with that? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> hey, why am I being born in Nazareth? It's not going to be born in Ma Nazareth. So anyhow, God had to arrange, arrange the circumstances so that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. And Mary and Joseph weren't going there because of biblical scholarship. They were going there because they were forced to. So Caesar made a decree, and uh, the, the world should be taxed. Now, the, they, they found documents. You know, years ago, there was always the, the criticism of uh, Christian, you know, Christian beliefs because, you know, that, the taxation didn't happen. It really wasn't so, something that the, the Romans did. And, well, now they found um, documentation and even found manuscripts that had the documentation on that people were to return to their home areas to be taxed. They had, the Romans made people go to their areas for two reasons. One, to see who's, who can serve in the military, you know, make sure they were getting all of the people that they could into their military, and two was for taxation, so those people weren't skipping out on their taxes. So, um, so we're not, uh, we're not behind the times. <laughs> Bible discoveries uh, are uh, approving, you know, what has happened and what was written in the scriptures is already there. I had, um, there was a uh, document, document, documentary, something, uh, on about uh, Baca, B, it's B-A-C-A, -A. it's in the Mediterranean, and... Um, they were, you know, everyone always says, where could the children of Israel ever pass through the Red Sea? You know, God opened the Red Sea. Well, there is a place in the Mediterranean Sea that, in, it's called Baca, and it's where this, there's this big, huge beach area, and there's this kind of valley that comes down to that area, and that is the highest place underwater <laughs> in the Med, in the Mediterranean, and people are looking there as being the place for the Red Sea crossing. Now, um, I always said, well, you know, if, if you've got an army of chariots and horses and, and everything crossing and all these people get crushed by um, waves and stuff, there's got to be some debris. You know, I always said, I, always said, I was smart. You know, oh, it's got to be debris. <laughs> you know? Well, they, they were... Uh, there was a window of opportunity for them to dive into the ocean there. And, of course, there's uh, coral around things and on that. But they have these pictures of 
as it were, wagon wheels <laughs> and of like axles that are, that are buried in that part of the sea. And they're nowhere else in any other area of, of, the, of the sea. Is, and then there's one, and I think it was made out of bronze or something or other, but the, um, the coral wouldn't grow on it, and it was sitting in the ocean, and it was a wheel that was of a five-spoke chariot, which was common for that period of time for, in Pharaoh's army, that would have been, there's four and five spoke wheels that indicate different time periods in Egypt, and that's the time period that uh, Ramses would have been following the children of Israel through the Red Sea. So, there you go. <laughs> now for the rest of the news. <laughs> but whenever you, whenever you start looking, and you start finding, and the guy, of course, who found this, and uh, they were... He was he was put in jail for a couple of months, and they had he had found other things, and they talked about it in a documentary or whatever his his video of it, and they, he hid them because he knew that they're still hidden. Whatever he found that was on the beach and, and under the sand, that all went along with that time period. So anyhow, so whenever we start looking at and why do why are all these? It's almost like we have to have. Um, we have to have some scientific knowledge in order to validate our faith. Well, scientific knowledge is good, but our faith isn't validated by what we see. Our, we, uh, our faith is validated by, the, by knowing that Jesus Christ came. Even if we have no physical evidence of this stuff, it's still the truth of God's word, and it resonates with our heart that we are his and he is ours and that we are together and we are friends in this. And that um, all the things that happen here that are outlaid in the scriptures are things that are true. Now, there, there may be some misspelling of words or a tense or something might be off in one translation or another. But as far as the uh, infallibility of the word, it's still there. You know, Jesus rose from the dead. <laughs> uh, even Josephus wrote, writes about those types of things and the Christian faith and, and so on. Uh, verse 4, And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Now, the, again, the, um, the scripture is saying that the prophecy given to David is that his kingdom will have no end <laughs> and that he will have an everlasting kingdom and that um, through, his, through his descendants all the world and through Abraham's descendant, all the world would be blessed. Well, here we have the descendant of David, and his descendant, of course, is Jesus Christ. And David has a father lineage and a Mary, a Mary, the motherly lineage, both go back to David. So even though Joseph is not the, the father, he is the father that is uh, uh, the one who's the protector and provider for, for Jesus whenever he's young and he's developing and taking care of Mary and, and helping her. So, so David heads off to, um, to uh, Bethlehem. So uh, what do we have here? It talks about actors on stage and how that, uh, how that people, whenever they are, how uh, actors and how that they are acting out the roles of of Mary and Joseph and Caesar and all that type of thing. It says, um, and it talks about this in Micah, it says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth then that remaineth of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel, and he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide from now, shall be great unto the ends of the earth. That's Micah 5, 2 to 4. So anyhow, um, whenever we would see the actors on stage, 
that, you know, Caesar's the big guy, you know, he's making the decree and everyone goes to back to Bethlehem. But in reality, the prophet Micah is the one who is uh, the big guy on stage because he's the first one who said, Bethlehem, you're going to be the place where the Messiah is born. You're the one, you're the place. So Micah, the prophet, is saying, you got to get back to Bethlehem because that's where um, uh, the, the Messiah is to be born. So when Caesar makes the announcement, he doesn't know he's fulfilling Scripture. <laughs> he doesn't know he's fulfilling the plan of God. The Roman Empire doesn't know they're fulfilling the plan of God. Mary and Joseph don't even know they're fulfilling the plan of God. But the plan of God is being fulfilled. So, verse 6. Any questions? Any thoughts? So, any doubts? <laughs> Any doubts about your life? Well, I've had a few doubts about... No. <laughs> so in, in verse 6 says, And so it was that while they were, uh, were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. Um... Most of the time, you know, when you think about this, we think, you know, we've, we've seen the play. Uh, perhaps seen the movies. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a nice, tidy little place. But, you know, I don't, I don't know. Uh, generally, well, in, in, Beth, in Bethlehem, there's, uh, there's this cave the, today. Now, there's this cave in Bethlehem. And... Um, the two churches are on top of it, okay? Their, their walls, the walls of their church uh, separate the cave. So one church has about a third of the cave and another church has two-thirds of the cave. And every year they bring the, they, they, they take Jesus from one church to the other, <laughs> you know, and bring him back the next year, you know, because they got to share Jesus. And uh, <laughs> so... And it, it's a cave, you know, it's not very, it's not like a deep cave, it's just kind of like a crevice that's hewed out into the stone, or just kind of like a natural crevice. And the the reason that you, we, you feel that this is an original site is because there's a well not too far from the the church. And always the communities were built around water. So Bethlehem... The Bethlehem of today is the Bethlehem of the day of Christ. Now, whether it is that exact location, they're not really sure, but tradition has it that this is the place. So what they would do is they would have this kind of indentation, maybe go back in 10 yards or so into the rocks, and you'd have enough space in there to, and perhaps they had built some post and maybe a wooden structure over top of the, the mouth of this pla- uh, a mouth of this cave. And um, again, if you have the inn full of people, you've got a barnyard full of animals. <laughs> so, you know, this place, and I'm sure that they didn't clean the barn out every day. <laughs> you know, they probably cleaned it out once or twice a year, um, maybe. And so it would be a stinky barn. And, uh, but it might be warm because of all the animals. But that's, that's about it. And the feed trough could have been a manger, um, could have been stone. Uh, we were at the um, Tell, um, you know, the place where they had dug down Tells, where the, the armies would build a, a fortress, and the people who conquered them, they would you know, basically destroy the fortress, killing the people inside. Then they'd build another fortress, and another fortress, you know, and over the centuries, you have this what they call a tell. And if you go down different layers, you come to different, you know, different uh, rulers of that area. Well, in the one place we were at, the tell was at the level which would have been Solomon's uh, horses, Solomon's stables. And in that location, in that area, was a trough dug out of stone. And so the stone was, you know, it's not, it's not one you pick up and move around. It's uh, maybe three feet wide and 10, 15 feet long. 
and there's a, a trough in there, and that's where they fed the, the horses. Well, perhaps that was something like that would have been the manger that Jesus would have been laid in, and, uh, or it could have been something made out of, made out of wood. But he was uh, born in this stable, which stunk, <laughs> and that um, it was a place where they gave, wrapped in swaddling clothes. Now, there's, it's, there's variations of what swaddling clothes are. One is, um, the one commentary here talks about it being like a triangle shape of a, like a diaper. Okay. Well, in other translations says that it's strips of rags. So whether or not Mary and Joseph had enough rags to bring with them for the journey for five days, you know, you would only bring what you could carry on a donkey and you're going you're gonna to be going for five days and how much are you going to be able to take with you? So uh, some of the commentaries have said that it was just rags that they found in the stable. Way back. <laughs> like a sumo wrestler. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it more than, you know, here they are, their poverty. Mary and Joseph are not wealthy by any stretch of the imagination. But I'm sure that they were prepared somewhat to have a baby in Nazareth. But, you know, Caesar came along and messed up everything. But in reality, he was making sure everything, God was making sure everything was as as it was dictated in Scripture, as it was foretold. And see, that's why um, sometimes we don't think God is in something, but we have to be beyond it and look back to say God is in this. And that's why the Scripture tells us to, in all things, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. It isn't so much that what we, we, we are appreciative of the negative and the hurtful things that happen, it's that we are giving thanks to God because in giving thanks, we're looking for the good. We're looking for how that God is going to turn this around to something better than what we see it. And that's Mary and Joseph. I mean, looking at this situation, they are fulfilling the plan of God, but in their minds, they're not, you know, it, up until maybe the uh, shepherds showing up, uh, they're thinking that maybe they blew it. <laughs> you know, here we are. Or maybe they just walked in peace knowing that God is in control. You know? Maybe maybe they just had this peace that God is in control and He'll He'll take us where we need to be and He'll He'll provide for us no matter where we're at. And maybe they just had that type of a an attitude. You know, I think I would be the more anxious. Why didn't we do on this, you know? <laughs> Why didn't I get here two weeks ago, God? Yes. Yeah, but they didn't show up again, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> only taken one. But, you know, how many times have we heard from God, really felt this was God, and the next day we're saying, I wonder if that was really God, <laughs> you know? And no, 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 you know, it's like, you know, we, we hear from God, was that bad pizza? Was that an angel or was that bad pizza? You know, so we, we we wonder about you know, I wonder as a wonder out under the stars. <laughs> oh yes, oh yeah, they did what they were supposed to. Yeah, and I'm sh- you know, and you know, I I don't know, but I, so it, it, you know, I, I'm sometimes we inject our own selves into some of these things, and maybe we should just let it be as it is. They probably were at peace and in knowing that God's in charge. And when we get there, we'll get there and it'll be fine. So, and I'll go with that one instead of me. So, verse 10. Um, oh, maybe it's verse 8. Yeah, I think it's verse 8. 
And they were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came unto them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. Now, shepherds, um, the shepherds were probably, they're, you know, most, ever, most of the commentaries now think that the shepherds that were watching sheep were not normal shepherds. These were the shepherds who watched the, watched the sheep for the temple sacrifices. So they were the ones who, the, the sheep that were to be sold for sacrifices in the temple, they were kept by these shepherds. And, you know, they watched over them. So um, these are the shepherds that the angel appeared to that would have told them the Messiah is born, who is the Lamb of God, who will take away the sin of the world. How appropriate. (laughs) So, and the shepherds, now, I, I remember reading one translation or one commentary said, and the angel appeared unto them. Now, most of the time we have this idea of the, you know, all these angels up in heaven. Well, this, this commentary stated, the angel appeared unto them like they're standing around or sitting around the campfire or standing there watching the sheep and all of a sudden an angel is standing there. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> you know, and uh, they're so afraid because he's not out there. He's right here. <laughs> And he's talking right to them. And, and uh, he, he, he said, The glory of the Lord shone round about them. And, you know, so there's this brilliance and this light and this person, and there he is. And, he's, and so the angel said unto them, Fear not. So don't get too excited about this. <laughs> I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign to you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. So the angel's declaring to them, this is what you're going to find. This is where you need to go. This is what you're going to find when you get there. And, you know, they were so afraid. And and he goes on to say, And suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. So sometimes we have this understanding or this wrong perception that God wants to get even or God paybacks, you know, for mistakes and failures. But from the very beginning, the the Prince of Peace has come to bring peace and goodwill and that the whole idea of restoration is in place. So God is there, God has come to restore us to that relationship that he had with us before the fall, before Adam and Eve uh, broke the commandment. So the restoration, so the angels declaring to the shepherds, you know, you you guys, <laughs> I'm giving to you the message. And, and again, the message is to the shepherds who are attending the flock of the, sheep, uh, uh, of the sheep that are going to be used for sacrifice. So I'm bringing you the good news that... There's a lamb of God born in a manger. And, but you, wouldn't it be appropriate for a sheep to you know, have its young, normally out in the countryside, but if they, were, they would be born in a stable and perhaps people would be there and put it in the manger. But anyhow, and it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, so they hurried off to Bethlehem, and what was, their, what was their message? Unto you is born this day a Savior. So um, the shepherds, so let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning the child. So they came to Mary and Joseph and told them what had happened. Now, I'm imagining, I'm imagining, that the angel spoke to Mary, the angel spoke to Joseph, the angel now spoke to the shepherds, and confirmation, 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 there's something special about this child. You know, you know it, and you've been told it, but I'm also declaring it to others. And of course, then um, the, when the shepherds left, where did they go? They went to tell other people. 
So I want, I want to tell you what happened to us last night. <laughs> well, how, what bar were you at when you saw the angel? You know, how much were you? But anyhow, the shepherds returned, glorifying, praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told them. And um, it's time. Well, the next one is when they accomplished the circumcision and Jesus, uh, his name, you know, was, he, he should call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And uh, so the salvation, the sal- you know, he is Savior. And, and I, um, it goes on to confirm by the uh, 40 days after the purification, they, went to ta- they took Jesus to the temple for... Um, circumcision and um, the no that was eight days but anyhow 40 days later they took him to the temple and Mary and Joseph brought doves pigeons and the pigeons were the poorest of the poor and it was there that the prophet prophetess two individuals came and said my I can I can now go because this is I now have seen what God has promised to me the savior of the world so over and over and over again we have this confirmation um, with Anna the prophetess and, and uh, Simeon. And uh, we have these individuals coming along and giving to Mary and Joseph this declaration. So if Mary and Joseph had any doubts <laughs> that uh, God was coming to make sure, uh, confirmed again, confirmed again, confirmed again. And, uh, and the next time we have... <laughs> uh, an angel showing up is whenever the uh, wise men come, maybe a year and a half later, because Herod, Herod um, wants every child under two years of age killed in Bethlehem. So he's figuring out the dates that the wise men were, you know, they had seen the star and they'd come to the palace and then they went to Bethlehem and gave Jesus gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Well, that was the uh, money for passage to Egypt, because that night the angel appeared to Joseph and Mary, or to Joseph, and says, "Go to Egypt because Herod's going to kill. You know they're going to seek to destroy the Messiah, seek to destroy the child." So they left before Herod could show up with his his mob. So you have all these things going on in the life of Jesus. Now, what are the things going on in our life? And how many angels have to show up for us to know it's all part of the plan? Father, we thank you that you, have, you know our hearts and our minds and our, Lord, our situations that we find ourselves in. And God, we pray that we will give you thanks and praise for all things, knowing that you are our Savior, our friend, you are our Messiah. We ask, Lord, your blessing upon this day and our lives and our families, and God, that um, you are the Messiah, the one who would save us from our sins. Amen.